The largest opposition party, National Democratic Congress, has formally presented its running mate to the Ghanaian voter. With Professor Nana Jane Upukwajiman officially outdoored, the NDC ticket has signaled it is ready for the 2024 elections. But the John and Jane ticket is not new to the Ghanaian elections. In 2020, the duo lost the elections by some 500,000 votes. Jane's retention is the first for the NDC and a win for women not only in the party, but the country at large. Tonight on Hot Issues, we ask, how does this galvanize the women's front in politics? Many thanks for joining us here on Hot Issues with me, Kemini Amano. My guest tonight is the country's foremost female attorney general. She's a strong advocate for women's rights and women's participation in politics. She's also a leading member of the NDC. She joins us tonight as we delve into politics, women's rights, and the criminal justice system. My guest tonight is Betty Mould Idrisu. You're welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you very much for having me. The NDC finally outdoored his running mate. The ticket is set. How ready are you for the elections? We're very ready. We are. Almost done, I think, in mm -hmm. terms of the processes leading up to the actual start of the campaign. We are waiting for the Electoral Commission to open um, the registration again of those who have attained the age of 18, then do the voters transfer and voting by proxy and other things. Mm -hmm. All of that should be completed between May 7th and June 14th, I believe. And we will then, you know, launch our campaign mm -hmm. in full after we've finished the bureaucratic processes necessary towards the election. We'll talk about that campaign, but I want to talk about your running mate, uh, uh, Professor Nana Jane Pokwajima. Yes. You were at the event to uh, outdoor her and formally oh, yes. present her to yes. uh, the, the country, so to yes. speak. What stood out for you? Actually, her speech. <laughs> it was phenomenal. We didn't quite expect that kind of fire coming out of her. And it was so on point. I mean, everybody was just mesmerized, you know, at the fiery nature of her speech. And, you know, I mean, it's not enough to say she's a professor so she can speak, but... She has definitely come of age in this political arena. It's unfortunate I even have to say that, but it's because of the gender issue. Otherwise, you wouldn't think you have to say, that. you don't say that about a man, mm -hmm. but you have to say that about a woman. But she's a woman of substance. She's um, a woman of integrity. She has led, and you know, leadership is very important in politics. And being assured of who you are and uh, what you can bring to the table is also very important. It's easy to say that, oh, you know, but she's done it before. Yes, she, she's done it before. Mm. She was a minister of education, first uh, vice chancellor, first female vice chancellor of our public universities and uh, former minister of education, former vice presidential candidate, mm -hmm. and now the second time vice presidential candidate. It's a magnificent feeling that we are able to break this issue that we have in Ghana about mm -hmm. women reaching the very top and um, be able to present somebody in such an exemplary manner. Right. And we, we are sure that with her, our success and our victory will be complete. I, and, I, and I want to talk about uh, that ticket, uh, the growth that you have seen. And there's no deny, de, you know, denying that. Uh, you know, the, the Nana Jane we saw in 2020, obviously, has, uh, has come with a certain fire, like you've said. But what does that growth mean to the tickets you're presenting uh, in December 2024? Oh, it means that now President John Dramani Mahama, former President John Dramani Mahama, our, our presidential candidate, is enabled now, maybe not to look over his back or his side so much, 
being a little worried about her and how she... He knows that now he can do his own thing and she can definitely do her own thing. And I think that it's laid to doubt all the issues, you know, little tensions here and there in the party about who should be where and what camp mm -hmm. there should be and things like that. I think it's laid that to rest and we are able to move forward. And um, there is so much to do to get an assured victory. Mm -hmm. There's, there are so many steps to take. And so I'm happy, I'm delighted that we have been able to come out with the pairing, um, you know, in very good time. That's mm. important also. It's very strategically important. So we're able to rally everybody behind her and we are all, we have a tunnel vision now. And that is how we are going to win mm. on December 7th. In, in 2020, there was a lot of concern around your running mate and her ability to pull in the numbers. And, um, you know, she's here again. A lot of people are happy about it. But what do you say to people who continue to hold uh, that concern? Oh, they, ha they have their opinion. But as a party, if you are a member of a political party, you are enabled to have your own opinion. But when it comes to the politicking and to the necessity to pull behind the candidates in order to win, that you must do. Otherwise, then you stand apart and you are not, you are not helping us in the process. There are issues around everybody. You know, if you go and ask a certain section, they will talk to you that there are issues about John Dramani Mahama himself. He's coming for four years. And Jane, you mm -hmm. know, Nana Jane herself and this and that. And me, myself, you know, there are issues about everybody in politics. And you must give people their entitlement. And you must also take into account some of the things people say. Look. There are 16.8 million women in Ghana. We need, we need a seat at the top table now. This is the time for women. And um, I think it's the best possible decision. Um, I, I don't think there's any looking back. Mm. It's not only about being the first, as Nana Jane herself said. It's about being able to maintain that ethos, you know, of bringing a viable gender or genderization mm -hmm. into our politics. Because let's be frank, our political parties have not been very good on gender Indeed. issues. So this is our opportunity. And it's not always true to say that having, just having a woman there is, you know, is the way forward. Mm -hmm. But NDC has that reputation. We had, um, you know, the first woman speaker of parliament. We've always been a party that stood for inclusivity. The first female attorney general, you're not <laughs> saying that. I didn't want to say that about <laughs> myself. Yes, the first female attorney general and other such firsts. And I know the difference it made, not only to my life, but to the life of other women attorneys, state attorneys, mm -hmm. and they, because, well, I do gender work as well. I've always, you know, been involved in gender, but I think that um, they, they appreciate and respond to you in a certain way. It's important, it's important that our girl children are able to aspire mm. to be who we are today. Let's come back to the ticket. Do you think that Jane will bring in the numbers you need to win the elections? Well, we don't need much to win, actually. It's half a million votes, <laughs> you know. That is really what we need to win. If that was the correct number that the, the win was achieved mm -hmm. by in 2020, half a million votes is not a lot to bring on board. And while we acknowledge the deep-seated nature of some of the politicking and some of the division of votes, you'll find that, um, you know, she, she will contribute significantly. Mm. In my region like that, we pulled an extra 200,000 plus votes in 2020. 
we are likely to pull even more than that, especially with the advent of the butterfly movement, mm -hmm. you know. So we are looking um, at her being on the ground. She's been very much in central and western regions, and we have some pivotal parliamentary seats to pull there. The central region, Queen Mothers and Chiefs were down there mm -hmm. for her on Wednesday for her outdooring. She has based herself for the last three years in central and western regions. And, um, I, and she, she's also managed to bring about a certain class, an aura of, of, of uh, not elegance, but of accomplishments mm -hmm. because she's the chair and the president of several organizations right. to do with academia and gender. I know how difficult it is to get there so, and to manage the situation. And, um, you know, I think, I think that this time things will not take her back. You know, she's only looking forward and what she herself can bring to us. Mm, very well. So uh, we've been looking at some uh, data here. And then we notice that the NDC itself has a history of not necessarily repeating uh, uh, the Iranian mates. Uh, we've only seen that in the in the uh, um, you know in in the last few years. So it, it must have been um, something that pulled the candidate to choosing. Uh, uh, Pro Professor Nana Jane Opokwajima. What do you think those considerations were at the time he made the official announcement to the party? Well, it is, while it is true, I acknowledge it, it's true to say that we haven't kept, you know, the same running made twice. The dynamics this time are rather different. Um, President John Dramani Mahama is going in for just a four-year term. Mm -hmm. And as a party, we are then going into another period of choosing another leader. And I believe it may be one of his considerations that if I bring Nana Jean on board, then the pair of us might exit. I don't know. I'm just saying that might be one of his considerations. Instead of the party people likely saying, you cannot impose a successor on us. Mm -hmm. You know, that type of politicking, which is, you know, you hear in all parties. So I think that might have been a consideration this time. Mm. And that's why you pointed out that it is um, rather, it is unique yeah. in the NDC. So this is a unique Absolutely, time we are going into uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, so then it brings me to the question whether or not there could have been a better choice. For me, not at this time. Mm -hmm. This is this is the way forward. He, 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 she has been endorsed by the Council of Elders, by the various organs of the NDC. There was a, quite a lot of consultation. And if there had been serious issues, believe me, you, I know my party people, they would have raised it. And um, the, other possible, the other possible contenders mm. might also have realized that, look, maybe we can wait our time or maybe we can come to some sort of agreement. The, I don't know. Were there possible contenders? Oh, there are always possible contenders. Some <laughs> that you knew about? Oh, of course. It was all over the media, <laughs> which you are part of. No, <laughs> not, not rumored contenders. <laughs> like people who were actually on the list, you know, on for, their consi list. for consideration. Not, not, maybe not on his list, but uh -huh. on their list. And in the party, people, maybe sections of the party mm -hmm. had people they might have preferred. For example, we heard for a long time, oh, we need a running mate from Ashanti region yeah. for this singular to, 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 to block, or they thought it might block this problem or help us to overcome the problem of the deficit of votes because the most votes we need, which are up there for grabs, so mm -hmm. to speak, are in Ashanti region. But, you know, we, we cannot look at ethnicity uh, forever. You know, we have to 
we, 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 we have to look at a way out. I'm happy the way out was gender. And you know I will always support that. Indeed. I, I, I want us to look at the campaign that will come along with the uh, ticket. How differently do you expect to, or, or should we expect to see it this time? This time, I personally and as a party, we have been looking to the youth of Ghana. You know what has happened in Senegal and in other places in West Africa. It has been the youth that have propelled the change. And it's the youth that have propelled even the necessity for change. The party, as I have always known it, has always been youth-centric. Youth We've mm -hmm. always centered ourselves around the youth and made many, several milestones in having you know, the youth on board. Nana Jane, she's not a youth, mm -hmm. I am not a youth, but we know, because I lectured, I was also a lecturer for several years, we know how to attract the youth, how to cultivate them, how to appeal to them mm -hmm. so that they can make an informed decision. And I think that the youth this time should be or is one of NDC's major focuses. Our, our second focus, I know, obviously, if you're a politician, should be in my own region, in Ashanti region, because that is where the votes are. We have over a 1.4 million deficit of votes, mm -hmm. and that is where we believe we can get the uh, Akan vote, mainly because this time we are coming out with a very well-prepared strategy mm. in terms of the people that we are putting to look after our ballot boxes and protect them on the D-Day. There are preparations ongoing for that. And this time, our eye is on that ball in a very fierce way. And if you have been in the Shanti region as many times as I have during on an election day, you understand that um, it's a welcome development by the party this time to keep ourselves there. So Ashanti region is, would be my mm. second. And we've said it, the party has said it, that it is of special interest to, it is of special interest to us. And there, um, the third issue would, of course, be that of gender, mm -hmm. you know, enabling women to see that, yes, we can, and yes, we do have it, and vote for her and see what positive changes she can bring in. I think she's already said a lot Indeed. about the appeal she has and the, the, the burning need she has mm -hmm. to not rid the country, but to put us back on the right path and to, to get us out of this almost helplessness that we are in now, mm -hmm. uh, this, this cultivation of arrogance and greed and not being able to see what is happening to our own people. I think she's, you know, this, this is one is of the areas that Nana Jane herself mm -hmm. is very passionate about. We'll talk a bit more about Prof, but also the Ashanti region when we come back. Don't go away. Many thanks for staying with us here on Hot Issues. My guest tonight is former Attorney General and prominent member of the NDC, Betty Mould Idrisu. Thank you so much uh, you. for honoring our invitation to come here and, and, and your patience. Uh, let's talk about the Ashanti region. It will seem that the government of the day is ahead of you because so far they have uh, started to show or respond to the, sentiment, the sentiments of residents in the Ashanti region when they told them that they felt neglected. We have seen Ameri renamed and taken over there. We have seen road construction in many parts of Ejiso. Um, some political watchers have connected that to the 2024 elections. If that be the case, then your dream of capturing the Ashanti region has already fallen through. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you see, I told you I've been there 
I'm there. I, you know, I live there some of the time. And I was definitely there throughout 2020. And it's exactly the same things that they did. So now the Ashantis are saying, hey, who person we are going to you? You Bringing in articulators, land uh, excavators, land graders to come and do roads. We even saw it at the Kumawuba election. Can you believe? And even at Asin North. I mean, this is the, the Ashantis now knew. The old woman in the village now knows that this is their modus operandi, is to come and, excuse me to say, blink, blinker us with this, I don't want to say fool us, you know, mm -hmm. I'm on national TV. But this is what they do. So believe me, it is not being taken seriously at all. And they believe that they have suffered. I come from a small village in Quabre, and I tell you, what we suffered. I was home last week. The, the Dumso, after the naming, the renaming of this Ameri plant, the Dumso that we have experienced in the region is unparalleled. Mm -hmm. they, even during our time, there wasn't Dumso like that. And people are really now fed up. No longer, we have a whole wave of youth, you know, and older people, people who lived, who have lived through. John Dramani Mahama, Nanado Danko Akufado, and who are now going to make up their minds. Mm -hmm. And they have seen the promises that were made. One village, one dam, and etc. cetera, one million dollars. One, uh, don't let's go on about mm -hmm. that, because I do not want to be derogatory. But I'm just saying that now, the people have seen for themselves. And... Um, I, I don't want to sound ethnocentric or anything, but I think that we are coming into our own now, where it's not only about being an Akan party. I thought we would see more of that in 2020, but we didn't. I, now, when I go home, I hear a different story from my, my aunties and uncles, aged people, the youth, I, we hear different stories. I went on a shop to shop and I've been on a, a home to home in different parts of the region the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I was delighted. Before, if you go into the Akan speaking areas and you say, but now it's a different story. Mm -hmm. The numbers are frightening. But as I said, we have our strategy in place, and I believe that we will see a big difference. We only need to win Ashanti region by just some 32%. percent And we are all set. We're all set. How about the central region? Because in the, the central, last election, yeah. you had only recovered uh, barely 3%. The central region, the problem was in getting the... Um, in getting the seats back. If you look at it, the differential was very small mm -hmm. in most of the seats. The differential was just a couple of thousand with that between winning and losing. I vetted the central regional candidates mm. in uh, 2018 or so. They, they were a fantastic bunch of candidates. And I'm sorry that not more of them were able to get into parliament. This time... I believe that their eye is on the ball this time. And the campaigning has been made much easier by some of the inertia that has been showed, mm. the lack of promises fulfilled in the central region. Take Greater Accra, for example. Do you know that there's only an 81,000 deficit, you know, in the boots? This is nothing to make up, mm -hmm. you know, when... It can, yet we took all this number of seats. We, all the polls are projecting that we are going to win. We are going to gain at least another 12, 15 seats. I so see. the majority in and, parliament and, and, is... And, and this gain, do you think it is because people are unhappy with the government of the day, the NPP government, or it is because the NDC is giving the people a believable, a workable alternative? Both. 
the MPP has proved themselves to be quite helpless. They have not been, they have not lived up to their own word. It's not the word of Betty Muldidrisi or John Dramani Maham or Nana Jean. It is their own words, what they said they were going to do. And as I said, people have come of age. In their lifetime, they saw what John Dramani Mahama did and Professor Mills, the late Professor Mills, what they did for the region, a region that doesn't really give us that kind of support. Mm -hmm. And they compare it to what is happening now, and they are astounded. They cannot believe what's the level of neglect or negligence now. And that is why we were a bit surprised at the high number of votes in 2020. And this time, we are holding the Electoral Commission accountable, and we ourselves have put a very, very watertight strategy mm. in place. We have a new elections directorate, and I can assure you that they are doing marvelous work right now. Since you have brought up the Electoral Commission, let's look at that before we go into you know, a couple of quotes from Jane's speech. Um, the party and its flag bearer have appear to raise concerns about the Electoral Commission uh, and uh, their ability to handle the election in a free and fair manner. Uh, do those concerns resonate with you and how? Of course it resonates with me. You know, in life you, have, you don't only give the appearance of being fair. You must inherently have some fairness and justice in you. And we haven't seen this adequately represented in the Electoral Commission for over the last uh, seven years. It's only recently that we went back to the IPAC because of deep-seated underlying issues, but also because we represent over three million people. We know that we have to come on board and take their concerns on board and engage the Electoral Commission. Look, in Ashanti region, for example, they created almost 1,000 additional centers within the space of months. You know, we already have 6,700 polling stations, and then you add this huge amount, and where do we train our polling agents in time and get to know what is happening? It, it was very difficult, mm. you know, because the region is so huge out of maybe the 40,000 polling stations in Ghana, we have 7,000 alone. Out of 47 constituencies, we have only four, four MPs. Mm -hmm. So the eyes and ears that you need to be on the ground maybe are not there as much as they should be. But the Electoral Commission needs to treat us fairly. Mm. They need to respect us as a party. And they need to know that we also have not a stake in this. We have our members, the mm. NDC members. Over three million people voted for us. We have to ensure that their interests are well represented. All we're asking for is fairness and mm. equity. They should come to the table looking at NPP, NDC, and the Butterfly Movement. Or is it now the Alliance for the Change? The Alliance yes. for Change. As, you know, as equal partners who have stakes in the election process. Very well. So I, what I want to understand now is what fairness means, because it would appear uh, that there is that opposition rhetoric that if we don't win the elections, it means that, and it's not just you know, NDC specific, but it's just some, something that exists for the opposition, opposition parties. If we don't win the election, then it means that the Electoral Commission or whoever was in charge at that point was not fair to us. Is that something that the uh, uh, you know, elections management body is doing now, that it, you, you think it's not fair to the party? I, <laughs> I think that the whole process of engaging the NDC for the last seven years has not been the best. And I think we need to, they are now maybe understanding that, and we need to move on. They need to move on in that regard. Maybe they are doing it now. I'm not part of IPAC, 
so I can't talk to it. Mm. But I know that when our people go into IPAC, they demand that there should be at least um, a, a, cons a, a consensus in the views, the final decisions that are made. And some of that did not happen before. Look, if you come to some of uh, underrepresented regions and you see what happens on the ground, you will then understand the angst of our people and then understand that in some places the EC itself has a problem. Mm -hmm. We are the they're undergoing a recruitment process right now and we are hoping that they will be fair and equitable in that recruitment process so that we will not get, you know, one-sided electoral commission officials. So there's so much that they can do, you know, from, from ensuring that we are well in the picture. They've come out with a timetable mm -hmm. on time. I applaud them for that. Now they should let us know how many electoral centers they are going to add on in a timely fashion so that we too, we can get ourselves ready. It's not now, it's, I, I believe the figure is 749 um, uh, uh, voters. If you reach that number, then it will be split. Mm. So you have an A and B situation. It impacts highly on us in the region, some of the regions, because we have a fast-growing population. Right. And you know Ashanti is one, Greater Accra is another. Greater Accra is easier, easier in inverted commas, to police because the, of, it's more of a, a, a city, you know, an urban environment. When you get to some of our regions, Eastern and uh, Ashanti, they are peri-urban, most of them. Mm -hmm. And it becomes very difficult for us to be able to access some of these um, uh, centers and issues on time. So we're just asking for fairness. We right. should. Right. I, I want to read you something from Jane Spee. She says, the purpose is the opportunity to hold our country together again to heal Ghana. It is about the chance to pull Ghana from the precipice of destruction, of normalizing corruption, of incomprehensible greed, from despair. What is the NDC offering as alternative? Everything, I think. <laughs> I honestly never thought Ghana could sink to these depths that we've sunk to. I think we're offering what we are and what we were, you know. The, they know what NDC stands for mm. as a party. The, uh, but, but the NDC itself has also not been without its own problems. Nobody, no, no political party and, and so, in this and so, world and so is for, for without the, its own problems. Fair point. Yes. But and so the saying, question will be, what will be different this time? Oh, for if example, you, if you are talking about the number of ministers, I think John Dramani Mahama has already made a commitment for that. If you're talking about the power issue problems, I think that they've made commitments towards that. You know, uh, there's, there's a whole lot of things, especially the financial mm. instability in the country. I mean, there's so much. There is so much. Things that I never thought possible could happen in Ghana has happened. You know it. I know it. And they say the five-year-old child in the street even knows it. So the, the, I don't think that this is a venue for me to vent out, you know, the rage and despair mm. of Ghanaians. Go to the streets of Kumase or go to the streets of my village and other villages and ask them what they feel like. And they will tell you, yeah, breath. Mm. Well, one of the things you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation is, you know, what Jane stands for also within the party galvanizing the, the women's base to uh, su support Jane. Um, what, it, it, you know, this resonates with something you said in 2018 about the party being able to bring together its women, its young people, and uh, people from the Zungu communities. Where would you say the party is now when it comes to its relationship with women and young people? 
It's in a good place now. Of course, it could be better. One of the things that has made me sad is that elected political leadership for women, I believe, has done a downward slide in, this, in the last um, uh, elections Indeed. for par parliamentary candidates. Mm -hmm. And I, with that, there will be even fewer women in parliament. I think there were 16%. Mm. With that, there might be fewer. And those are the issues that we are hoping Nana Jane will come and address, you know. Um, the question of the youth, we do have very effective youth leaders and communicators who are filling in the gap. And there is a very big gap, you know, between the youth and the political elite in inverted commas. And we saw in Senegal, as I said, people, mm -hmm. the youth taken to the streets and prepared to die. We don't want to see that in Ghana. And wherever I go with the party, wherever we have functions, I'm always, like we, we did on Wednesday, I'm always, it's, it's shocking to see the number of youth, mm -hmm. their enthusiasm and what they want to do for the party. Mm -hmm. And this they take out into the rural, peri-urban areas as well. It's not only in Accra. And I expect Nana Jane, because she has dealt with youth almost all her working career, will be able to recognize that, tease that out, and bring them on our side. Mm -hmm. It's true. Nana Ado has had... <laughs> the mantra of free senior high school. Nana Jane was a former education minister. I was a former education Absolutely. minister. And I know the things that I did. I know the things I did to try and help the girl child when I was minister. And I know that some of the things mm. Nana Jane herself did mm. when she was minister of education. She is... I, I was... I'm, qu I'm quite shocked... I was quite shocked to see on your TV station yesterday that there's going to be a new school uniform and with a bow tie. Is that true? Well, um, <laughs> they, they have come to give an explanation to that. And, um, but really, yes, that's what the... Will there the, be the, a bow tie education... or won't there be a bow tie? <laughs> that's <laughs> what the education minister told us. Yes. It's, it's shocking to me that at this point, when we have such... Awful conditions prevalent in our educational system at all levels that we are talking about having a new school uniform, really. It took us years. Does, does to, the color of choice bother you? Blue and white? Of course it bothers me as a politician. But it's the whole issue of why do we need to do this now? Now, just before we're going into an election. And the, 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 the Ghana education system is not in shambles, but is facing a lot of despair, mm -hmm. you know, from unpaid uh, school supplies to free HS being very shambolic, you mm -hmm. know, and um, the, the teachers, uh, each, each day you wake up to a different section of teachers Indeed, threatening, threatening to go on to go strike. Sure. The whole SNIT issue, they're very worried now. I was shocked yesterday mm -hmm. to see again. They're saying that in 2036, there might be no money mm -hmm. left in SNIT, despite all of the investments they made. There might be no money left in SNIT mm -hmm. to pay pensions. <laughs> there might be no reserves left. The, things are, you know, I say... And that's, sho I, that's shocking to you? It's shocking to me. It's shocking to me, and it's not because I'm a woman. I think it's shocking to anybody who is any youth, who is mm -hmm. just starting out to work now, and will get their pension in 2036. And then what are they going to do? You know, people depend on their pensions. Mm -hmm. Look at the, the, the reaction when there were these haircuts and razor blades and other things. You had old age pensioners like myself out on the streets, and these were intellectuals who did not belong to NDC or MPP. Real. So it's, it's time we got ourselves together. When we come back, um, by virtue of your past 
as the, an attorney general. Well, I want us to look at some of the rulings from the Supreme Court in recent times and what you think about them. Welcome back to Hot Issues. Today we have been discussing the NDC's efforts to wrestle power from the NPP on the back of the outdooring of their running mate, Professor Nana Jane Opokuajima. My guest tonight is former Attorney General, prominent member of the NDC, Betty Mulder Driso. Again, you. again, thank you so much for your thank patience. Thank you for having Indeed. me. I, w I want us to look at you know the drive towards election 2024 before the uh, uh, formal presentation of uh, Prof. We know that the flag bearer had been going around the regions on his building Ghana tour. What did that achieve for the party? Oh, I think it was, it was great. And I think it was a very good initiative. He listened. Mm -hmm. It was a listening tour mm. more than anything else. So he would have community engagements with different communities, some of them not necessarily uh, in our strongholds. And then he would also meet different sections so if it's the business community, which he met in Ashanti region, they turned out massively to meet him and to present their grievances mm -hmm. to him and to assure him of their support, of course. But um, so all over the country, he's done the 16 regions now, and each of them had their own peculiar problem, their own peculiar time with him. And it's, he allowed you know, citizens, ordinary citizens, both MPP and NDC, and those who maybe had problems within the party or within the region for one reason or the other, you know, to, to, to talk to him mm -hmm. directly. Mm -hmm. He had it all for himself across. And it's going to enable us to, to factor some of these concerns and these proposals into the manifesto mm -hmm. which we are which we are finalizing well, what do you think the key concern uh, is or maybe for, perhaps uh, you know a better question would be uh, the common denominator when it comes to the 16 regions it was it, it, it it's the rate at which the economy has come down. Mm. The economy is the biggest issue because it hurts everybody. It hurts the school children, it hurts their parents, it hurts the grandparents, it hurts families, it hurts single mothers, where you don't have functional hospitals, where you don't have um, uh, schools, you don't, you're not able to pay teachers. Businesses are collapsing in Ashanti region. All we heard were cries that they haven't been able to import anything mm -hmm. for the last year or two because of the dollar rate. You won't hear that maybe in the OT region, but you'll hear it in Accra and Tema, and you'll hear it in Ashanti region. So there were different concerns across different regions, but all of it had to do, most of it had to do, with the sharp economic decline we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. That was the common denominator, as far as I can see. And of course, our people want, are just yearning for change mm. and seeing what we can do. Does the NDC have its campaign team yet? Your opponent has outlined a massive list of uh, able people uh, to lead their campaign. Oh, they should bring it on. We're waiting. <laughs> no, actually, I think that we're waiting. I think the president, John Dramani Mahama, said at the end of May, I think, mm -hmm. we'll have our campaign team. Ready. Should we expect to see you on it? I'm always on the campaign team in Ashanti region uh -huh. anyway. <laughs> Everybody knows me as the mother of the party in Ashanti. Uh -huh. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm chair of the legal team, the legal, the lawyers. And this time we're playing a big role in the elections. Mm. And, you know, so we should expect to see you pay, play, you know, really, um, again, I'm using the word prominent role in the campaign? I've always have. You always have? Always have, but I, I don't usually, I do media <laughs> engagements, but I, you know, I'm always on the fields. They, mm. they know me for that. I'm well known I see. for doing that campaign. What, what would the campaign do differently to ensure that they are bringing home victory? 
This time, I, I have been telling them this time that we have to address the issue of the youth. Mm, the youth. And let them know that they are a backbone and let NDC, you know, let, let us reclaim the youth for victory. They are our victory. They say that the majority of the voter population is between the ages of 18 to 40. That is what we need to mm -hmm. harness. And um, I think I've had several discussions with our communicators, both in the region and nationally, and they are doing a lot to bring the youth on board in a mm. pivotal position. So the campaign team will uh, bring the victory home for, for the, um, the NDC. Now let's turn attention to uh, the Supreme Court. Recently, they have um, ruled in a number of cases, one of those being um, ruling against uh, salaries for spouses of the president and his vice. What are your thoughts they, on they that? They declared it unconstitutional, Absolutely. if I remember. And it's, it's simple, really. Um, there's nothing in the constitution <laughs> you know, which enables it. Mm -hmm. So this, this to me was rather a simple, uh, a simple way forward. And if there's nothing in the constitution that enables it, neither party should actually be, you know, supporting mm -hmm. that. But there must be a way out. The constitution, we had the Constitutional Review Commission. I started it mm -hmm. under Professor Mills, mm -hmm. under Professor Mills' direction. We did so much work. And then I believe that um, we also had an implementation committee. After they went to every region, so many communities and districts came out with so a huge voluminous, you know, um, finding. Mm -hmm. Nothing has happened. A big fat nothing in all this time. And I think that that's an issue we we have to look at decisively. I know that our party wants to do something about the review of the constitution. Mm. Constitutions, um, they're living documents. They do get out of date. They get out outdated or genuinely, we might have left one or two things out. Like for example, this first ladies mm -hmm. and second ladies thing might have just been left out. So we, we, we have to really look at the review of the constitution. I do not but, recall uh, mm -hmm. whether the, 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 the spouses, so to speak, that issue was addressed in the constitutional review. I'm, I don't recall. Mm -hmm. I'll have to ask mm -hmm. Professor mm -hmm. to go back. Mm -hmm. But, you know, outside of the law, let's look at the subject itself and perhaps broach it a little bit. Wouldn't it be all right? Wouldn't it be the right thing to do to pay these spouses. Oh, I agree with you. I haven't said otherwise. I, I just said that it's a constitutional blip, mm. you know, and if you take it to court, this is what the court has ruled, and they are not necessarily wrong. I disagree with the Supreme Court in a lot of things, but this time I can't say much, you know. If the law doesn't allow it. If the law doesn't allow it. But there should be some enablement of it because, my God, the work that first ladies and second ladies do is phenomenal, mm -hmm. you know. And there's so much demands made on them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it gets them into, you know, fixes because they, they don't have those resources. Mm. And they think because your husband is president, you must have those resources. Mm. Hence, all the foundations that have been set up by various first and second ladies, mm. you know, going out looking for donor funds and relief funds and so on. So I think it's something that we should look at. Mm. You, you know, it's got me wondering how, you know, they have, um, and, and, and perhaps it has got you wondering as well, how they have then survived eight years while their spouses or whatever term mm -hmm. while the, their spouses have been in office mm -hmm. because they are unable to work for, mm -hmm. you know, a private entity. No, so they, they do, well, all of them have set up foundations. We have the Laudina Foundation. Uh, so the foundation then north. pays them. Yes, so, well, pays them and enables them to, to do, you know, to do the philanthropic. Because they've got to earn a living. 
Yes, but <laughs> we are not enabling them any yeah. little bit. I think that when Ghana recognizes that, and it's something we should look at in the constitutional review, if it needs that. Mm, I see. The other ruling is for dual citizenship. Uh, the Supreme Court has agreed that, uh, you know, those with dual citizenship can become chief justices. And, they didn't uh, agree. To, they, they legislated it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that is the problem that we have uh -huh. with it, you know, that they, legis they, they, they then came and gave the positions, Chief Justice, mm -hmm. what's what, mm -hmm. they, you can have, no, that should go, Parliament should do that, they shouldn't do that. If right. you have declared some sections of the law unconstitutional, it's your prerogative. I told you, I don't, I don't always agree with the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. I, I try to respect their decisions because mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer. But, um, uh, you know, for me, we should now, they should have sent it back to, to parliament? parliaments, for parliaments to look at the legislation. You struck some of it mm. out as being, you know, against the, the constitution. constitution. That's understandable. Is it too late for parliament to relook? Let us leave that to the Speaker of Parliament and mm. the Chief Justice and possibly the Executive. Let's see what they have to do about mm. it because it's, you know, it's not the best situation. I don't think it's the best ruling. I might agree or disagree with it. We have some issues with it which I can't discuss <laughs> national. Would love to national. hear just a little oh, bit. Oh, no, no, no. But, um, you know, all in all, I think... I, let, I can say this, mm -hmm. that the Supreme Court, I think, overreached itself a little in mm. this particular matter. Oh, yes. I, see. Yeah. I see. But there was only one judge dissenting, Justice Puamang, who we appointed. So they might think that we are doing it politically. But I don't think mm. what we are saying is, is, uh, is coming from a total political point of view. Mm. So I see. Well, why don't you talk about why haven't the spousal rights bill, which I presented to Parliament, 12 years ago, why hasn't it been passed by Parliament yet? Why hasn't there been more implementation of the interstate succession laws? And mm -hmm. it should have been not, not, for not, another session. Not, not <laughs> just that, but also the affirmative action bill. I know. It's also sitting there. I know. You know, we always get to that point and then we come back. It's not we. It's, the, it's with the MPs now. So I think we need to do something. In fact, it's one of the few times I have been to a leadership conference on gender in the last couple of years. Uh, Netrite held a uh, roundtable conference with 25 women leaders on Tuesday mm -hmm. to see the way forward. Mm -hmm. And this is seeming apathy when it comes to um, the, the gender movement. There, there's a rollback in the movement anyway across the globe. Yesterday, I saw that Harvey Weinstein had been pardoned, something which led to this huge, you know, outcry by women. And mm -hmm. women were coming up telling their stories of abuse and rape. Now he has been, um, the, the, that ver the guilty verdict was overturned by a U.S. Court of Appeal. But I'm digressing here. We're talking about um, the way forward mm -hmm. for gender and some of these bills. And I think that Netrite has started this laudable initiative. We came out and decided that something positive must be done, like mm -hmm. we did with the DV bill coalition and other things. We must bring the women, the leaders of the women's movements together mm -hmm. and let us see how we can arouse some more knowledge. While we are on the issue of uh, courts, let's also you know, expand it a little bit and look at our criminal justice system. Is it time for reforms? I was Attorney General in 2009. Within six months, my eyes opened massively. Even though I had been a state attorney, I, all my career, my professional career, was at the Ministry of Justice. And I, <laughs> I can tell you that Ghana needs a massive transformation mm. in its criminal justice system. It's not enough to have ad hoc 
ad hoc, let me repeat this, ad hoc responses to difficult situations like remand of prisoners. Mm. Who, people can be remanded for seven, eight years. You know, dockets lost. It's not enough to set up a court in the prisons to handle that. There must be a holistic review. Mm. I tried it. I know Honorable Marietta Brew also tried it. I'm sure Honorable Gloria Kufu has also tried it. It's a very difficult thing. Mm. But it's not as difficult as it has been made out to be. You come up against blocks in the system. Why do we have prosecutions? The Constitution states quite clearly that the Attorney General shall be responsible for prosecutions, and yet you have police prosecutors. Mm. And we cannot manage as the Attorney General's department without the police prosecuting certain cases across the country. Why did, until recently, did we have only one uh, court of appeal sitting? Why weren't we able to continue with the system of court of appeals in mm. all the regional capitals? We need more district courts. We need to be able to ensure that there's a domestic violence desk in mm -hmm. each police station and that the police are trained in how to handle domestic violence issues. There's we, a lot. There's I a can lot talk for an hour on it. And <laughs> I'm that. even mostly out of the picture now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to uh, Betty Mould Idrisu. She's former Attorney General and a prominent member of the NDC. We've talked all things NDC. We've also uh, looked to put a spotlight on the Supreme Court and the justice reforms necessary here. But we've also... Uh, look critically at gender issues in Ghana and why some important bills are still sitting in Parliament and gathering dust. We hope that uh, you enjoyed our episode. We'll be back here same time next week. This has been Hot Issues and I'm Kemenia Mano. <laughs>